Say why hello fellow Patriots and welcome back to the Patriot Dad channel where we can discuss current events and modern issues all while keeping it as real as possible. Today we're going to be discussing proxy wars that are going on between the U.S. and Russia as well as the U.S. and Iran. The United States along with most superpowers in history have been engaging in proxy wars because the thought of war between two modern superpowers is almost unfathomable. In the nuclear era say after the advent of nuclear weapons the appetite for large-scale conflicts between world superpowers like we saw between the persians and the greeks at the battle of thermopylae and you can see here in a little article from the collector links in the comments below that modern estimates put the size of the army from the persians at 120 to 300,000 men and against them stood about 7,000 greeks led by the 300 spartan hoplites that were portrayed in the movie 300. While the movie was an embellishment on true history for cinematic purposes, battles are just not fought that way anymore, for good reason. Today's wars are fought between proxies because a battle between superpowers would be highly technological, fought from long distances, and would be over in a matter of minutes, with victory coming through the total annihilation of the opponent. Now, the thought of fielding hundreds of thousands of combatants on an open, Battlefield would be silly with today's weapons. You can see here in this picture the top of an intercontinental ballistic missile equipped with a multiple independently targetable re entry vehicle or MIRV allow today's superpowers to literally rain down nuclear warheads, as seen here in an image from a test of a MIRV system. Just remember that the end of each one of those streaks of light could potentially be a high yield thermonuclear device. Who in the world wants that kind of fighting? The answer is nobody, for good reason. And that thought is what birthed the military doctrine of mutually assured destruction, or MAD. You can see here in an image from the YouTube channel The Infographic Show, to which I credit this image for, both sides of a potential conflict such as the Russian and American Cold War knew that the other side would maintain enough retaliatory capability to return fire and annihilate the attacker. Instead, the U.S. and Russia started a decades-long set of proxy wars where a game of human chess has played out ever since. Now, whether we're talking about Afghanistan, Ukraine, or many other countries that we as superpowers have ravaged, the same thing happens in the name of preventing full-scale war. Both sides in the proxy war treat target countries like chess pieces on a game board. They take the people in the country, they pit them against each other, they overthrow the government that's in place that supports their opponent, and they put in place a government that's friendly to them. We saw this in Ukraine. We've seen this in the Middle East repeatedly. We've also done this for decades in South America. It's accomplished through espionage and acts of subversion. And can you imagine if the spy masters of yesterday during the Cold War or many of our previous proxy conflicts had had the power of the tools that we have today through social media and the internet? Now, I wish this wasn't the case. I really do. I think that treating millions of people as if they are disposable in preference to a real war, I don't even know what that means, discredits their value and assumes a level of superiority by the superpowers that are involved. The belief that it's better that people die over somewhere else to prevent people from dying here is just disturbing to me, to say the least. So right now, we have proxy wars being fought in Ukraine, Israel, and in Yemen. These proxy wars are a way to dance around and avoid all-out war between superpowers, but what happens when we have treaties and other defense pacts with the territories involved in these proxy wars? We get escalation. An escalation of conflict is never good. It just increases human suffering. Now, Ukraine is not part of NATO. It wasn't at the beginning of the conflict, and I really hope that it isn't at the end of it. So we didn't really have a formal reason to defend Ukraine, other than the fact that they were being attacked by Russia that we perceive as a political adversary. Right now we do have alliances with Israel. These long ties between our countries and theirs meant that when they were attacked, we're supposed to defend them. And you can see here in an article by the New York Times that no one knows how long this will last. After 100 days of conflict, the assessment of most of the key players is that Iran has pushed its proxies to make trouble for the American military and to pressure Israel and the West in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and the shipping lanes of the Red Sea while going to some lengths to avoid provoking a larger eruption 
It is the most delicate of dances, rife with subtle signals, attacks and feints, and deniable action. The evidence of caution is piecemeal, but it's everywhere. While Tehran has ramped up its production of uranium drastically in recent weeks, reviewing fears that it may be speeding again towards the capability of fabricating several nuclear weapons, it's carefully kept just below the threshold of bomb-grade fuel. That's considered to be a red line of sorts that could trigger military action against its underground nuclear complexes. So here we see them just kind of tiptoeing around and making sure that they don't cross the last red line, but they're going to push right up against it until they just smash right through it, is what usually happens when you look back at history. When Israel struck into a suburb of Beirut on January 2nd to kill a Hamas leader, it mounted a very precise attack exactly the opposite of its campaign in Gaza to avoid harm to nearby Hezbollah fighters. That allowed Israeli officials to make clear to Hezbollah, the terrorist group funded and armed by Iran, that it had no interest in escalating the tit-for-tat strikes on Lebanon's southern border. So again, here you can see that these proxies are just picking at each other, but they're not pushing so far as to provoke full-scale escalation and war. Unfortunately, we've seen in recent history that we have abandoned our allies in Afghanistan after fighting with them for decades. And now with Israel, we have positioned ourselves in a no-win situation. You can see here in this small clip from an article in Al Jazeera that on Tuesday, the commander of the Houthi forces said that we are prepared for a long-term confrontation with the forces of tyranny. The Americans, the British, and those who coordinate with them must realize the power of the sovereign Yemeni decision and that there is no debate or dispute over it. So by taking such a hardline approach, they're not leaving much of an out. They're just gonna continue the conflict. Either decision we make at this point is going to look bad for us. Either we escalate tensions in the region or we get seen as further abandonment of an ally if we don't help Israel. Both of these options are a negative for the United States and our interests in the long term. If we continue to bomb people overseas, we will continue to create more hatred for our country and the younger population who grows up with U.S. ordinance raining down on their sovereign country. Today's victims are tomorrow's freedom fighters. We're perpetuating a cycle that will never stop as long as we keep repeating our part in it. The United States is now locked into the insanity loop that is the military-industrial complex. Why are we so entrenched? We're the largest international arms dealer in the world by far. And if you look here at a little article snip from the Council of Foreign Relations, President Joe Biden announced the end of his U.S. support for the Saudi-led offensive operations in Yemen in February of 2021 and revoked its designation of the Houthis as a terrorist organization. Now, was that the right decision? We'll find out. However, the United States continues to sell weapons into the region. Strange. I wonder if there's a reason why we aren't trying to end these conflicts. The United States greatly profits from the continued global conflict, as seen here in a Statista breakdown of the world's biggest arms exporters. Countries responsible for the biggest shares of global arms exports from 2017 to 2021. You can see here that the United States exports more arms than the next three countries combined, and that's Russia, France, and China. We export an enormous amount of weapons into the world and profit greatly from doing so. So what incentive do we have to end these conflicts? Because total war is no longer appetizing in the modern world, countries need to be very calculated in how they conduct these proxy wars. And we see that carefulness here with the Israeli conflict. This modern concept of war makes very little sense to me. The old battles like the Battle of Thermopylae and the revolution make a lot more sense to me. Try to leave the civilians out of it, build your army, let the men do the fighting, and whoever wins, wins. Ever since the advent of total war, war really should just be avoided. In my opinion, it seems like winning the hearts and minds would be a much more effective way to getting someone to see your side of an issue, at least more so than dropping more warheads on foreheads. Do we really think that dropping more bombs on Yemen is going to make them like us more? I, it won't. We can see here in a snip from another Al Jazeera article, that the United States and the United Kingdom have launched airstrikes in Yemen in the name of stopping Houthi actions in the Red Sea. So we're trying to protect commerce is the guise that we're using. But the Houthis have continued their attacks on ships off the Yemeni coast in the name of ending Israel's war on Gaza. So as strikes Sheikh Sana'a, a potential for escalation looms. 
Where does that leave the Yemeni people? Where does it leave the rest of the world? So we're claiming that we're doing it to defend Israel. We're also doing it to defend shipping and international commerce that passes through the Suez Canal. But is dropping more bombs on Yemen really the answer to get Yemen to stop escalating this conflict? If they're going to keep fighting until the conflict between Palestine and Israel is over, that, that conflict has been going on for thousands of years at this point. Do, do we really think it's going to stop anytime soon? So if they won't de-escalate until that conflict's over, are we just going to be locked in battle forever? It doesn't seem right to me. Something that we haven't learned in the decades we've spent in the Middle East is that you can't bomb people into understanding your way of life. Trade of goods and mutual respect for each other is the best way forward. We're not going to see eye to eye on religion and government probably ever. The amount of force that it would take to have a universal and global government that treats everybody in the world the same would be terrifying. It would be so authoritarian and overt, it would be something you would never want. It would be out of a dystopian movie. It would probably look like The Matrix. We should be working towards a future where people are free to exercise their religion or government of choice and where we can trade with our neighbors freely for mutual benefit. Capitalism, to me, seems like the best way forward to accomplish that goal. What are your thoughts? And we'll dive a little bit more into some of those other topics in coming weeks. So thank you to those of you that made it to the end of this video. I greatly appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and leave a comment below. If you want to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to my channel and click the little bell icon so that you can be notified when I upload additional content. Please share the video with friends and family to help keep them better informed and maybe start a discussion of your own. Don't just read the media. Don't just repeat what you're told in the news. Do some thinking for yourself. I think you'll benefit greatly from it. Feel free to leave a comment also if you have a recommendation for a future topic for the channel as I do accept any recommendations and like to create these videos based on what you guys in the audience want to see. To those of you that have made past recommendations, thank you very much. I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Take care of yourselves. God bless and bye for now. Go ahead and check out one of the links on the screen now to either subscribe to the channel and see the rest of the videos of the channel or one of the carefully selected videos that you may wish to see that YouTube has used its algorithm to select for you.